Hey, welcome to Vive Church. You have found us in our Tongues of Fire series. This series is all about the mystery of the faith now revealed and this invisible kingdom that we're a part of. I know you're going to be blessed by this content each and every week. Enjoy. We get into the Word of God. Would you open to 1 Corinthians chapter 14? 1 Corinthians chapter 14. For the biblically astute, you would already be shaking and aware of what we're about to partake of. For those who are more ignorant in the Word of God, you are naively entering into a powerful passage of Scripture. And what we have in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is the Apostle Paul presenting quite a contentious passage of Scripture. Let me go ahead and read it to you. It says, Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now, I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets so that the whole church may be built up. For week two of our installment uh, in, in, in Tongues of Fire, I want to keep it real simple for the, for the you know, all the note takers, all the, all the people who like to write down the sermon title. I'm going to keep it really simple, really easy. The title of the sermon today is Speaking in Tongues. Speaking in Tongues. Tongues. Are you ready for the Word of God today? All right, we'll remind your neighbor because your neighbor ain't sure. Your neighbor is uncertain. I feel it from the stage. So why don't you shake your neighbor real quick and say, get ready. We're about to speak in tongues. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> so my twins turned 17 this week. And I uh, treated myself to a brand new firearm as a gift to myself. I don't really care for your proclivities, your polit political position on firearms. I, I encourage you to keep it to yourself and your Facebook followers. But for me, I'm a father of daughters, and so it is my job to serve and protect my family, all right? Okay, it's my job to serve and protect, and I feel more uh, equipped to do that with the right arsenal, so to speak, you know, when I'm prepared for any intruder that may come my way, be it an animal or a person, I'm going to protect my family. It is my job. And to be honest with you, the protection part is kind of easy. It's the serving part I find difficult. Anyone know what I'm talking about? I'm trying to connect with all the dads of daughters here. The, the protection part, that instinct is natural. I mean, you mess with my daughters, you mess with me. It's, it's, you, we're we're going we're gonna to find out how that goes for you. But it's the serving part that is hard because I am the only male in my household. That means if there is a bug to kill, if there is anything to be lifted physically, a jar to be opened, if there is, it's, there is no rest for the man in our household. I'm serving constantly. I'll even find, uh, Kira at times will say, what are you doing? Can you just relax? I'm like, relax. Wouldn't that be a novel idea? How do you think things happen around this place? <laughs> the other day she caught me. I was had these goggles on and a screwdriver and I was diving into the pool. And she's like, she literally said, what are you doing now? I said, would you like to know what I'm doing now? You see, at the bottom of our pool, at the 10 foot deep section, there is a, a little grill that covers the inlet to make sure no rocks or you know, anything that gets sucked in there and breaks the pool pump. So it broke, so I have to dive down there and, and fix it. And, and she's like, well, why don't you get someone to do that? I said, what a novel idea. Wouldn't that be grand? I just get someone to fix it. Wouldn't it be that I already talked to our pool guy who told me to fix it. He's going to have to rent like scuba diving gear and he was telling me the cost. And I said, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and keep my money because I got some skills. It's only 10 feet. I mean, how long does it take to screw something in? Like 60 seconds? I can do that. So I did it. Here I am, goggles on, screwdriver in hand, brand new little cover. I dove down. I realized quickly, I can't hold my breath. <laughs> like on land, I can hold it for six. Under, what happens? Something changes. But I got it done. I got it done. Because as a man, you can't always rely on other people. Sometimes you got to do things for yourself. Where are all the men at? 
I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a big believer in having people around you, having people support you, relying on others, sharing the load, being the body. I love it. But then sometimes there are some things that you've got to do for yourself. Sometimes you've got to do something. Not, there aren't people that can do everything for you. Sometimes you've got to do some things for yourself. I want you to keep that in mind as we explore the scriptures today, because what we have here in 1 Corinthians 14, as I said, is arguably one of the most contentious passages of scripture prepared for us by Paul. It presents a topic that is possibly more controversial today than it actually was for the original audience, believe it or not, because it illuminates a specific spiritual gift that for some reason has been used as, as a tool to denote a specific denomination instead of reinforcing the mysterious nature of the kingdom that we are all a part of. It's a section of scripture that is ultimately focused on revealing the power of tongues and the power of the tongue. And what we find the apostle doing is he is comparing and he's contrasting the difference between two types of speaking, which are unknown tongues and prophecy. That's how he lays it out. He compares the two. Now, before we get into breaking these two elements down, I wonder if you would allow me today to draw your attention for a moment to just how much emphasis the Bible places on the power of the tongue and speaking for that much. For starters, what you're going to find in Genesis, in the Genesis account, we find that speech was fundamental and foundational to the formation of the world. We, we see in Genesis chapter 1, that each creation phase was a result of God speaking, and as a result of speaking, things formed. That as God spoke, things were created. As God merely spoke the word, matter came from the speaking of the word. Matter began to form. Things began to take shape, not because of any other matter, but at the, at the actual word of God, things began to appear and materialize at the word of God. We see it all the way in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. We find it says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. We see it in Genesis 1, 6. It says, And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. Let it separate the waters from the waters. Verse 9, it says, And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. The same goes on and on. We see in verse 11, verse 14, verse 24, verse 26, where, where God said, Let us make man in our own image. And yet there man was formed. And I like verse 27. Maybe I could quickly read that to you because I feel like it's something that our society is confused on today. It says in verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Just leave it there as a good pastor. Now, now it's not just Genesis. But if we were to actually move beyond Genesis, and if I was actually to take you on a scriptural journey throughout the Bible, you will find that time and time again, the Bible emphasizes the power of the tongue. We see that by Proverbs, in Proverbs, we actually get an articulation of the very power that's in the tongue. In Proverbs, it says in 1821, it says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. If we were to even fast forward to the New Testament, in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, at the Great Commission, this was Jesus' commission to us as the saints to continue the ministry and the redemptive work of heaven. We're gonna find that the tongue is essential an essential element to the fulfillment of the Great Commission. Wow. The Great Commission to go out and preach, to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. It says in Mark 16, 15, it says, and he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Now, now don't worry, I, I, love, I love Instagram and stuff too. I love a good quippy quote. I, I love uh, Francis, uh, St. Francis of Assisi, you know, that, that saying, you know, uh, preach the good news and when necessary, use words. I love that because it's talking about, you know, live uh, like a Christian, model Christianity, show kindness, goodness, you know, make sure that by the way you live, you're preaching the good news. But by my, my, my goodness, preach. Preach as well. Because... The Great Commission is a commission to proclaim, it's to speak, to preach. N now let your actions back up your words rather than your words precede your actions. Let, 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 let the way you live follow the fact that you are proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ and salvation in His name alone. It's, it's a powerful commission when you speak. In fact, Romans 
reveals this element of speaking also, but from the reverse polarity. Paul's kind of clever because time and time again, they talk about the power of the tongue. But in Romans 10, 17, he says, so faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. In other words, he's saying faith is a result of hearing. So someone better speak. (laughs) Someone better preach. Someone better take the word of life and the word of God and begin to speak it in such a way that the people of God can hear it and let their faith be built because faith comes by hearing, but someone's got to speak it. Are you here today, church? Uh, I was warm up. I'm I'm going to present a case to you today. It's it's my plan. Most of the time when I'm picturing you and preparing for you, I, I, I picture you on my side. You know, like it's not, we're not against each other. I picture you on my side that we're a team and we're all just exploring the word of God together like we would in a group, a Bible study. But today I, I, I wanna pick you as my enemy uh, and I wanna present a case to you. I wanna try and convince you. I've been watching a lot of Suits. Now it's on Netflix. I've been watching the season again and I feel like Harvey and I feel like I just gotta present a well-rounded case, biblical case for you to convince you of what the Apostle Paul is trying to present to you today. And if I'm gonna do an emphatic job, I'm talking about the power of tongues in the Bible, I would have to also include James for you. Because in James, what we find is that James gives us a warning when it comes to taming the tongue because misunderstanding its power can actually be devastating. James chapter three, verse four says, and a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go. And even, even though the winds are strong, in the same way, the tongue is a small thing, but makes grand speeches. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting the entire body. It can set your whole life on fire for it is set on fire by hell itself. Kira and I took a red eye recently and I don't recommend them. We we, we do our best not to take red eyes, but we had to be on the... East Coast, and the only way to get there and fit everything in is we had to fly through the night. And, and we landed early, and, and, and we landed early enough to be the first person at the rental car counter. You, you know what I'm talking about. So we rock up to the rental car counter, and they'd already opened up, and there was ample people behind the counter. We were the only people on the customer side, but, but, but no one was promptly serving us. You ever experienced that? Where you're like... Um, I, I know you probably like to not be inconvenienced by a customer um, and, and continue your conversation. But literally, we're there for a few minutes, and I, I'm not the, I'll be honest, I'm not the most patient person. And so I like to just, you know, let my presence be known and, and was just tapping on the counter, you know, just trying to, hi, hey, hey guys, I'm still staying sweet. Even though I have no sleep, I'm still trying to stay sweet. And, and, and finally, a lady came over and started to serve us only to inform us that there's a problem. And I said, okay, what's the problem? They said, well, do you have the card, the, the credit card that you booked the trip on? I said, well, no, I don't have the card. I feel like someone's got a witness, they know what I'm talking about. I don't have that card because that was a digital card that I used to make all my bookings. I got other cards and they're like, ah, oh, yeah, you see, we need that actual card. I'm like, well, I don't have that actual card, but I'll happily use any of my other cards because to me, money's money. You know, wherever it comes from, if it comes from Chase, comes from Bank, it's, it's all money, right? It's all it's like, you know, wherever. And they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, okay, cool. Um, let me help you solve the problem that I believe you're employed to solve. <laughs> and she's like, I, I can't do it. I said, what do you mean you can't do it? I said, there's nobody else here. We're like, do you have, are you out of cars? And she's like, no, 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 we, we, you have to cancel this one and then you're gonna have to call up and rebook another. I said, but I'm talking to you. You work for the company. I literally said this, my next sentence was, for your safety and mine, I am gonna step back and allow my wife to take over. I literally said that, didn't I, honey? And, and See, that's taming the tongue, people. That is literally self-control because we've been working on it, haven't we, baby? I'm getting so much better. <laughs> it's the truth. It's understanding the power of the tongue. I was about to set the whole place on fire. I'm telling you, with words that were ready to, I was about to spit fire, but I didn't. I tamed it. You're welcome. But this is the power of the tongue. The Bible knows about it. 
That's why the psalmist says in Psalm 141 verse three, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. The psalmist understood it before I begin my day, before I see my coworkers, before I even speak to my kids. God, set a guard over my mouth. Watch the door of my lips because what I want coming out, I need it to be guarded. It holds power. It holds, it, holds, it holds power. It could be devastating. Even Jesus himself emphasized this in Matthew chapter 15, verse 11. He says, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. You see, he was talking to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the followers of the religious law who were so articulate and careful in what they digested, what they put in. They didn't wanna eat anything that was unclean. However, he's saying, hey, hey, you guys are so meticulous in watching what you eat, but yet you don't give one regard to what's coming out of your mouth, the hypocrisy and the cursing and the slander that comes out of your your mouth. He says, it's not what goes in, but what comes out that corrupts your life. That's strong from Jesus. That's powerful from Jesus. He was de-emphasizing the religious elements and making people accountable for what they say. Because there's life and there's death in the tongue. There's life and death in the tongue. Some of you are wondering why my world feels cursed and maybe you're speaking death into your own world. I'll never get a job. I'll never lose weight. Well, you can go to the gym all you want, but if you keep professing that you'll never lose weight, you'll wonder why the treadmill don't work in your life because you're creating an environment that opposes the breakthrough power of God. The physical and the spiritual are connected. They're highly interconnected, but what we speak frames our world. In fact, what's interesting, and we're just scratching the surface of the Scriptures that talk about the tongue. What's, what I find interesting is just how much Scripture emphasizes the power of the tongue, even seemingly more than the power of the mind. I wonder why that is. I wonder if Scripture is revealing that the tongue can be powerful and also a destructive tool depending on how you use it, depending on how you use it. You see, what we find from the Apostle is he, He gives us a clear rank, albeit order, when it comes to the use of tongues in the context of spiritual gifts. In 1 Corinthians 14, he reveals two spiritual gifts that both require the use of the tongue. And clearly, he elevates prophecy as more important. For instance, he highlights that the one who prophesies speaks to individuals for their upbringing and their encouragement and as a bonus, they also build up the church. He makes this pretty clear that, that I'm comparing and contrasting unknown tongues and prophecy. And, and, and he's, he's not backward about it. He makes sure everyone knows that prophecy is better because it builds people up. Prophecy encourages people who hear it and the whole church benefit. In fact, he, he states in verse five, he states pretty plainly that the one who prophesies is greater. Greater than the one who speaks in tongues. Not just the gift is greater, but the, the, the person who speaks prophecy is greater than the one who speaks in tongues. Now, now, let me tell you why Paul makes this seemingly abrupt position by illuminating what prophecy actually is. Can you bear with me for a moment? Next week, we're gonna go deeper in on prophecy, but I do need to touch the surface of it so that we can put in context what the apostle Paul is presenting to us as the people of God. You see, prophecy is fundamentally a divine message mediated through an individual that is directed at a person or a people group and is intended to elicit a specific response. Prophecy can in fact have a few different functions. Let me give you a few. And possibly the most common understanding of prophecy is the foretelling of future events. This is known as predictive prophecy and it it often gives the recipient or even the witness insight around the future plans of God. This kind of prophecy is what foretold the coming of Christ and is what Jesus fulfilled when He ministered through His miracles, through His death, His burial, His resurrection and His ascension. He fulfilled the prophecy of foretelling future events. Now beside that, you also have prophecy as admonition. This can come in the form of a divine warning, in comfort, correction, exhortation. Sometimes they they both simultaneously happen, revealing the oracles of judgment and salvation at the same time. Now, prophecy can also serve a creative element framing the world around you. This is what it means to speak life, as I was saying. 
or speak death, that you have within the power of speaking a prophetic element to create, to create. In fact, when, when God spoke the world into existence, he essentially prophesied it into existence since it activated creation that is still continuing, continuing to ripple today. So when God spoke the world into being, he, he spoke the seed. And that seed goes forth and bears trees. Those trees bear seed. And those seeds bear trees. It's not hard. And those trees bear seeds. So, so there is a ripple effect to creation that God activated at creation, but prophesied it so that even in future, creation would continue to unfold and unravel. This is what happened, he, he prophesied it into the world, which I think one of the greatest examples of this is of the creative power of prophecy is actually with Gideon. You, you know the story of Gideon. When, when Gideon was, 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 was encountered the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord found Gideon hiding in a wine press because he was afraid. Let's be frank. He was afraid. He was trying to go about his tasks in hiding. And the angel of the Lord comes to Gideon and surprisingly says, mighty man of valor. This is because the angel of the Lord was not speaking to what was, but was speaking to what will be. And he was prophesying an environment around Gideon that ultimately set the framework for him to become the mighty man of valor that he wasn't in that moment. See, this is the power of prophecy. I am trying to preach to a people, honey, maybe you can do a better job next week preaching about prophecy, but I'm trying to get you into the place to understand that God has good gifts for his people. God has good gifts, powerful gifts, not token gifts that the spiritual gifts that God gives you are for power, to change things, to shift things, to move environments, to adjust things, to empower people, equip people so they can run. It's essentially why Paul emphasizes the importance of this in the church, that, that prophecy builds up the church, especially compared to unknown tongues, which is kind of the opposite. I mean, even if a prophetic word isn't directed to you, you can still benefit from hearing it because you understand what's being said. Unknown tongues, on the other hand, are not understood, at least by you. They're unknown. The Bible makes it pretty clear they're mysterious. They're mysteries. And let me explain because Paul says it like this in, in the, the beginning of, of 1 Corinthians, maybe I could go back there again. He says, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Now, now we focused on the prophecy bit, but I need to highlight that the Apostle Paul says something powerful there that I do not need you to miss. He starts by saying, desire spiritual gifts. He says, desire spiritual gifts. He is illuminating an invitation to ask for what's available to you. The Apostle Paul would not ask you or command you or instruct you to desire something if it was not attainable to you. So therefore, what we know from the introduction is that the gifts that God has are available. They're available. They're not essential, they're available. I can go my whole life walking with God, never really tap into His power and the gifts that He has for me. And will I enter into heaven? Absolutely. But will I live, maximize my life and my walk with God? Will I ultimately touch into the very things that God has for me to actually rescue me and to push me and to propel me and to hold me, have me as a leader? No. But they're available. They're available. And because they're available means they're not exclusive. And this is important. Paul had to touch on this because there were those within the church who, who, who spoke in tongues, who, who by speaking in tongues, they, they, they're speaking in tongues and they realize, oh, you don't do that? Oh, and like, no, I, I don't do that. Oh. <laughs> and all of a sudden they were positioning themselves in a hierarchical position of spirituality by I speak in tongues and you don't, presenting themselves and portraying themselves as more spiritual than others. But Paul says, oh, no, 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 no. Let, me, let me make this clear, they're available. They're available. Therefore, you can't use them as a rank or a hierarchy over others. If anything, he esteems prophecy as higher. He says, desire the spiritual gifts. It's available. Then he goes on in verse two to reveal, for one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God, for no one 
understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. He also says this in verse 14, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So the origin with tongues is different from prophecy. You see, prophecy is part God, part our mind. We find that in, in, in the previous chapter, in fact, in 1 Corinthians 13, 9, which says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. This means that I'm inspired, the word that I have in my spirit is inspired by the Holy Spirit, but he uses my mind, my vocabulary, my accent, my tradition, what I know, my language limitations, he uses that to deliver the divine word of God. So it's a partnership is prophecy. Is it God speaking? By all means. But is it my filter? Absolutely. Because it's part prophecy, part mind, part me. I've got to use my words, my friend. In other words, my mind is not a robot and my mouth is not robotic just speaking what I don't even know. It's clear, it's concise, it's articulated through what I have educated myself in with the Word of God. However, what we find is that speaking in tongues is the opposite. Speaking in tongues, while our mind is less engaged, our spirit is highly engaged. This is why it's also called praying in the Spirit, as it says in verse 14. Now, now here's the question that I have for you if I'm gonna embody Harvey. I, I wanna make sure I bring a great case to the jury and ask the question, why would it be useful as a gift if you don't even know what you're saying? Paul was very clear how prophecy was beneficial for the hearer and the whole body, but because everyone understands it. But what about speaking in unknown tongues when you yourself don't even know what you're saying? Well, I want to highlight as a case for you Romans chapter 8, verse 26. In another section of Scripture, writing now to the Romans, not the Corinthians, Paul presents it like this. He says, verse 26, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for what the saints according to the will of God. Are you with me? You ever prayed in a season of pain? You ever been in a season of opposition and you felt the pain and the pressure and, and all you find your prayer is, God, get me out. That's the prayer. Now, when you're facing pain and you're facing pressure, the only prayer you know to pray is, God, take it away. God, get me out. God, remove this sickness. God, remove this season. God, get me out. But what if God's plan is not to get you out, but for Him to get in? What if God is looking to use the situation? But in your immediacy of you trying to eliminate the pain, all you're praying is what you know is God, remove it. God, get me out of this situation. Missing the fact that just maybe God has a bigger plan than if you could just persevere. Instead of removing you, what if He could gird Himself with you and strengthen you and help you endure and help you persevere so that on the other side, there would be a testimony of God's power and His provision. But we don't know to pray that. We don't know to pray that. We don't know how to pray that. I'm walking by my feelings most of the time. I'm just praying, God, remove this customer service agent. I will go back there myself and tinker away on that. We, 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 we pray through our pain. But thank God the Holy Spirit knows what I don't know to pray. Thank God the Holy Spirit can pray with groanings and, and deep depth that I don't know what to pray from a surface level. Even more specifically, the purpose of Speaking in tongues is revealed in verse four. It says, the one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself. Just as prophecy builds up others, God gave you a gift to build yourself up, which is praying in the Spirit. This is what Jude 20 reveals, saying, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're thinking, okay, that's pretty cool. Um, pastor, but eh, I've, I've, done, I've done pretty good so far. Haven't prayed in tongues, 
haven't had that gift. And you know what? Yeah, it's been rough at times, but I've got this far. I, I want to suggest that you haven't faced the right battles yet. And I don't mean that in a condescending way, but I wonder if there's battles that you will face that are ahead of you that God's trying to prepare you and equip you, that if you would push beyond a doctrinal background or an ancient teaching or a historical thing that you missed out on because of the denominational lines that you grow up within, you're missing an element to your faith that God is trying to equip you with to prepare you for what's ahead. And I'm all for having people around you to fight with you, to build you up. We see that with David. David, he faced many battles. In fact, he had mighty men that girded around him and supported him in his conquests. But there was one battle that David fought that no one could fight for him. There was one battle that hit him harder than the other battles. And we find it in 1 Samuel chapter 30. Can I show you real quick? This is my closing arguments. In 1 Samuel 30, we see a story where David, it says, and his men, verse 1, came to Ziklag on the third day. And the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negev and against Ziklag and they had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire and taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one, but they carried them off and went their way. And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. David's two wives also had been taken captive, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David, check this out, was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. David's in a dark place. David's in a place where no one around him can support him because they all hate him. He's now isolated and alone. They're blaming him for the loss of the people because he was meant to lead them into victory. And the people that he could rely on to build him up, the people that may be able to give a prophetic word in that moment and encourage his body, they weren't there. So what we find is something unique. It then goes on to say, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. David strengthened himself. He had no one to strengthen him. So he had to go to that place where he could strengthen himself, where he could edify himself, where he could fortify himself in the Lord. <laughs> he had to find a new way. He couldn't just rely on those around him. Sometimes you need to edify and fortify yourself. Sometimes you don't need the doubt or even the reality permeating around your mind and diminishing your faith. Sometimes you, you, you need to pray what your spirit knows to pray, but you don't know what to pray. This ain't, this ain't for everyone, it's for you. That's what tongues is. It's not for everyone else, it's for you. Paul's very clear, prophecy is for everyone else, tongues is for you. But how good is God that He gives you a gift that in the season where you have no one around you to build you up, you have a source of strength to edify yourself and build yourself in such a way that it doesn't kill you from the race you can keep running. Now, now let me get this clear. Your honour. While Paul contrasts tongues and prophecy, he emphasizes that there's no conflict between them. He's contrasting them, he's comparing them, but he wants the hearers to know there's no competition with them. He says it this way in verse 15, let me show you. He says, what am I to do? Good question. Now that I know the power of prophecy and I understand the power of speaking in tongues, what am I to do? One's for others. That's beneficial. One's for me. And to be honest, I need it. What am I to do? He says, I know. I'll pray with my spirit, but I'll pray with my mind also. I'll sing praise with my spirit, but I'll sing praise with vive worship also. I, 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 need, I, I know what I need. I need both. It's not either or, it's both and. See, this is the... This is the goodness of God that He has given you every spiritual gift in Christ Jesus. That He's like, hey, it's available. It's available. It's available. If you want it, you can have it. It's available. If you need it, why don't you take it? It's available. It's for you, but it's, it's gonna be unlocked by you. 
so, so how do I access it? Now that we know that the Holy Spirit has the gift of tongues for us, the gift of prophecy, how do I access it? If it's available, how do I access it? Well, last week we spoke about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. We talk about being filled with the Spirit because we leak. We, in other ways, we, we get drained. People, anybody, anybody draining people in your life? Anybody just be honest? If my staff raise their hand, please don't let it be your boss. But we've got draining people, we've got demands, you've got pressures, you've got, the world will drain you. That's why you need to keep returning to the presence of God, being filled with His Spirit continually. I ain't gonna re-preach last week, but it's a great foundation to build upon. And so we know that once you're filled with the Spirit, the next step is to, and this is profound, ask by faith. To ask by faith. To simply say, Holy Spirit, what you've got, I want. Before today, I didn't even know what was available to me, but now I've come into the revelation of what's available. Let me actually equip my appetite that is now forming within me and not let it just be an appetite, but let it be an ask. Let it be an ask by faith to say, God, by faith, I want what you've got. If there is any spiritual gifts that are in the storeroom of heaven, let them not sit there. Let them be in my account. Let them be in my life. Let me access it by faith.